Hi, I'm Maddie, and I used to do, um, uh, cover videos of songs, but I think I'm going to start reading. Okay, so, um, today I'm going to be reading a chapter from It's Kind of a Funny Story by Ned Vizini. I don't know if that's actually how you, uh, pronounce his name, but that's how I pronounce it. So, before I start reading, um, I'm just gonna read this part of the book, um, and it's just, like, it's to tell you, like, about, it's a summary, I guess, like, you can say. Okay, so, there's no easy way to say this, so I'll just come out right out and say it. This is a beloved book about a teenager grappling with suicidal thoughts, written by a beloved author who took his own life. In It's Kind of a Funny Story, Ned Vizzini gave readers a very specific and real roadmap of what people suffering from depression experience. Told f through the prism of a hilarious assembly of characters and situations, a strange and delightful balance, to be sure. But it's so much more than a book about depression. It's about the promise of hope, strength, and the de desire to live. I first met Ned Vizzini around the time his superb first novel, novel, Be More Chill, was published. We shared mutual business colleagues and writing friends, and I admit I was very jealous of Ned before I met him. Who was this brash young man getting so much attention? Judy Bloom recommended his book on... The Today Show. What? He was barely out of high school. The jealousy quickly gave, away, gave way to admiration and affection. Ned was simply a great guy. Incredibly smart, gifted, humble, kind, the most loyal of friends, everyone else's biggest fan. It wasn't just Ned's impish grin, absolute sincerity, and infectious enthusiasm that drew me into the Ned Vizzini fan club. It was his true talent that won me over. The kid could write. He wrote with deceptive sim simplicity, which most writers will tell you is the hardest feat to pull off. On the surface, his writing was straightforward, relatable, smart, warm, funny, but his clean writing style dug deep into the heart and soul of his characters, revealing complex, nuanced people. Soon after his death, Ned's friend, Kyle Bryan, beautifully summed up Ned's gifts to New York Magazine. Ned simply couldn't tell a story without rendering a character in three dimensions. It's Kind of a Funny Story was written soon after Ned's own experience in a psychiatric hospital where he admitted himself on the advice of a suicide hotline counselor. It tells the story of a 15-year-old Craig G Gilner's time at 6 North, where he is treated for serious depression and anxiety. Craig is dealing with the typical pressures of a teenager, academic performance, navigating family and friend relationships, unrequited crushes, and nascent romance, but these pressures are amplified by debilitating brain chemistry, and Ned's gift to readers is the ability to s describe exactly how that feels. First published in 2006, It's Kind of a Funny Story has garnered a huge following of readers of all ages. Through its humor, frankness, spot-on characterizations, and sheer re relatability. It's become a treasured friend to young adults grappling with mental health problems and to their families and friends who want to understand what they're experiencing. The book throws a lifeline to those dealing with depression, as if Ned is there to reassure them, your pain is real, I understand, I'm with you, we'll get through this. Ned spoke openly and honestly about his own mental health issues and constantly strived to educate and help others. He lectured widely, widely on the topic to high schools and colleges and cons consistently tried to 
get the message out that help was available to those suffering with depression and experiencing suicidal ideation. I would be remiss here not to mention Ned's desire to promote, to promote awareness of the 24-hour counseling, count, counseling hotline available through the National Hope Line Network for people co contemplating suicide. 1-800-SUICIDE. 1-800-784-2433. Help is there. The ongoing love and influence of this book and the excellent movie adaption have been profound, profound and Ned and makes and make Ned's passing all the more painful because it because his work has helped to many so many through the very disease he himself succumbed to. Ned took his own life at age thirty two. I can't say I knew Ned that deeply, but from what I've gleaned with a little distance, it was clear Ned had, from an outsider's perspective, a pretty good life going. He had a warm, loving, supportive family, including a beautiful wife and son, a solid network of friends and colleagues who treasured him, and a soaring career. He seemed to have everything going from, for him. So in trying to make sense of it all, if that's even possible, I'm left to think that Ned's disease was sadly just bigger than that. Uncontainable. Yet that's another reason why the legacy of this book is so important, because it teaches how real and big depression is. It provides a trusting guide to those going through it. Ned showed what writing about pain with honesty, kindness, and humor could do. Heal, help, love, support. Craig says that that's all I can do. I'll keep at it and hope it gets better. Ned didn't make it. But with its kind of a funny story, he threw an invaluable lifeline to the people who will. This book has provided a beautiful beacon of hope to so many, and its legacy will shine brighter as the readers continue to find it. Now, let's begin with Chapter 1. Part 1, Where I'm At. That's, you know, I guess that's one of the maps that he, part of one of the maps that he made. Chapter 1. It's so hard to talk when you want to kill yourself. That's above and beyond everything else. And it's not a mental com complaint. It's a physical thing. Like, it's physically hard to open your mouth and make the words come out. They don't come out smooth and, conjunction and in conjunction with your brain the way nor normal people's words do. They come out in chunks, as if from a crushed ice dispenser. You stumble on them as they get... as, as as they gather behind your lower lip. So you just keep quiet. Have you ever noticed how on all the ads on TV, people are watching TV? My friend is like, Pass it, son. My other friend is like, No, yo, that's true. My other friend is like, There's always somebody on a couch unless it's an allergy ad. Then they're in a field. Or on a horse on the beach. Those ads are always for herpes. Laughter. How do you even tell someone that you have that? That's Aaron. It's his house. That must be such a weird conversation. Hey, before we do this, you should know. Your moms didn't mind last night. Oh, son. Aaron lobs a punch at Ronnie. The antagonist Ronnie is small and wears jewelry. He once told me, Craig, when a man puts on his first piece of jewelry, there's no turning back. He punches back with his hand with the big, limp gold bracelet on it. It hits Aaron's watch, clanging. Son, what you, what you trying to do with my gold, yo? <laughs> I can't do, I can't do that. Okay. Uh, Ronnie shakes his wrist and turns his attention to the pot. There's always pot at Aaron's house. He has a room with entirely separate ventilation system, a lock and lockable door that his parents could rent out as another apartment. Resin streaks outline his light switch, and his bed sheet is pockmarked with black circles. There are stains on there, too, shimmery stains, which indicate certain activities that take place between Aaron and his girlfriend. 
I look at them, the stains, then the couple. I'm jealous, but then again, I'm beyond jealous. Craig, you want? It's past me, wrapped up in the in a concise delivery system, but I pass it on. I'm doing an experiment with my brain. I'm seeing if maybe Pa is the is the problem. Maybe that's what has come in and robbed me. I do this every so often, for a few weeks, and then I smoke a lot of pot. Just to test if maybe the lack of it is what has robbed me. You alright, man? This should have been... This should be my name. I could be, like, superhero. You alright, man? Ah, uh, I stumble. Don't bug Craig. Ronnie is like... He's in the Craig zone. He's craiging out. Yeah, I've moved the muscles that makes me smile. I'm just kind of, you know. You see how the words work? They betray your mouth and walk away. Are you okay? Nia asks. Nia is Aaron's girlfriend. She, she, she's in physical contact with Aaron at all times. Right now, she's on the floor next to his leg. She has big eyes. I'm fine, I tell her. The blue glow of the flat screen TV in front of us ricochets off her eyes as she turns back to it. We're watching the nature special on the deep ocean. Holy shit, look at that, son. Ronnie is, like, blowing smoke. I don't know how it got back to him already. There's an octopus on the screen with giant ears, translucent, flapping through the water. In the cold light of the submersive... Scientists have playfully named this specimen Dumbo, the TV narrator says. I smile to myself. I have a secret. I wish I was Dumbo the octopus. Adapted to freezing to freezing deep ocean temperatures, I'd flop around down there at peace. The big concerns of my life would be what sort of bottom coating slime to feed off of. That's not so different from now. Plus, I wouldn't have any natural predators. Then again, I don't have any now, and that hasn't done me a whole lot of good. But it suddenly makes sense. I'd like to be under the sea as an octopus. I'll be back, I say, getting up from my spot on the couch, which scrugs a friend who was relegated to the floor, immediately claims, slinking up in one fluid motion. You didn't call 1-5. He's like, 1-5? I try. Too late. I shrug and climb over the clothes and people's legs to the beige apartment front door style door. I move through that to the right, Aaron's warm bathroom. I have a system with bathrooms. I spend a lot of time in them. They are sanctuaries, public places of peace space throughout the world for people like me. When I pop into Aaron's, I continue my normal routine of wasting time. I turn the light off first, then sigh, then I turn around, face the door I just closed, pull down my pants, and fall on the toilet. I don't sit. I fall like a carcass, feeling my butt accommodate the rim. Then I put my head in my hands and breathe out as I, well, you know, piss. I always try to enjoy it, to feel it come out and realize that it's my body doing something it has to do. Like eating. Although, I'm not too good at that. I bury my face in my hands and wish that it w could go on forever, because it feels good. You do it, and it's done. It doesn't take any effort or any planning. You don't put it off. That would be really screwed up, I think, if you had such problems that you didn't pee, like being anorexic except with urine, if you held it in as self-punishment. I wonder if anyone does that. I finish up in flush, reaching behind me, my head still down. Then I get up and turn on the light. Did anyone notice I was in here in the dark? Did they see the lack of light under the crack and notice it like a roach? Did Nia see? Then I look in the mirror. I look so normal. I look like I've always looked, like I did before the fall of last year. Dark hair and dark eyes and one snaggled tooth, big eyebrows that meet in the mi middle, a long nose, sort of twisted pupils that are naturally large. It's not the pot. 
which blend into the dark brown to make two big saucer eyes holes in me, wisps of hair above my upper lip. This is Craig, and I always look like I'm about to cry. I put on the hot water and splash it in my face to feel something. In a few seconds, I'm going to have to go back and face the crowd, but I can sit in the dark on the toilet a little more, can't I? I always manage to make a trip to the bathroom take five minutes.